two great powers with significant responsibility for global stability. And President Putin and I have had a significant responsibility to steward that relationship. I take that responsibility very seriously, as I'm sure he does. Russia and Americans are both proud and patriotic people. And I believe the Russian people, like the American people, are invested in peaceful and secure future of our world. Hello there, you're listening to The Naked Pravda. I'm your host, Kevin Rothrock, Medusa's English Language Managing Editor, and on today's show, we're talking about U.S. sanctions against Russia, the latest round of which the Biden administration rolled out earlier this week. More specifically, we'll be looking at what are called sovereign debt prohibitions. Though Washington also slapped Moscow with a few more targeted measures, we've seen those before. For example, the U.S. Treasury designated half a dozen Russian technology companies, which means that any of their U.S. assets are now blocked and U.S. citizens generally can't do any business with them. It sanctioned these companies for allegedly assisting Russia's military cyber program. The U.S. government also sanctioned another 32 entities and individuals for supposedly trying to influence last year's presidential election. This is the 2020 one, not the 2016 one. Together with the EU, the U.K., they're not the same, (laughs) Australia and Canada, The U.S. also sanctioned another eight individuals and entities related to Russia's occupation of the Crimea region of Ukraine and its severe human rights abuses against the local population. That's a quote from the Treasury. For good measure, Biden also expelled 10 personnel from the Russian diplomatic mission in Washington, D.C. Now, there's plenty of diplomatic importance here regarding which persons and organizations or businesses got named. When you impose these sanctions, you're signaling what you view as harmful and whom or what you hold responsible for that activity. As I was preparing for this podcast episode, by the way, Russia announced retaliatory sanctions, expelling 10 American diplomats from Moscow, ending the activity of U.S.-funded NGOs in Russia, limiting the U.S. embassy's hiring in Russia, and some more stuff. Not formally linked to the diplomatic response, the Moscow prosecutor's office also just announced that it is seeking the liquidation of Alexei Navalny's entire anti-corruption infrastructure a move that looks suspiciously like it's part of the Kremlin's retaliation at oppositionists, it has long argued, or Washington's secret color revolutionaries. Today, though, we're going to focus on the really sweeping sanctions on an international scale, which are still in part theoretical when it comes to Russia and the U.S. In this regard, the conversation is less about targeting individual people and organizations than about restrictions on macroeconomic financial flows. So today... We're going to talk about sanctions on Russia's sovereign debt. Can you tell me exactly what sovereign debt is? As I understand it, it's like when Russia needs to borrow money, the government, the state of Russia needs to borrow money. But correct me if that's if that's not quite it. No, that's correct. That's it? That's what it is? It's just like when the government needs to... Needs well, to- you, have, you have essentially two forms of sovereign borrowing, right? You have sovereign borrowing in one's own currency. So for Russia in, in rubles, for the US in, in dollars. And then you have foreign currency borrowing. That's Maximilian Hess, a political risk expert and a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. When I got him on the phone, or on Zoom, as it were, the first thing I did was to warn him that I have a hard time understanding any of this debt, monetary, geo, macroeconomic stuff. He assured me that I'm not alone, but he also stressed how damn important this stuff is. Fundamentally, I see this as as the plumbing of the international political economic system. We often, you know, try not to think about our plumbing because it's it's uncomfortable, but these issues really sort of bring to a fore bring to the fore how complicated that plumbing is, how little how how thin the public understanding of it is and in my view how significant small changes in the structure of those pipes you know how how significant the impact of that can be on on a country's political and economic well-being i see international capital markets the borrowing between one country and another as the most important 
sort of form of active daily international relations, if you'll put it that way. The ability for countries to borrow from one another and thereby move capital from one country to another has only really been around for the last 50 years. I won't bore you with the details, but essentially since, you know, we, we moved away from this gold backed system. And it has led to tremendous growth and to tremendous economic opportunity around the world. So international capital markets are good. They have led to growth and opportunity, and now the U.S. is trying to limit the Russian government's ability to raise money abroad, which presumably is bad for Russia because it wants access to those capital markets. The latest sanctions action targets specifically what is known as the primary market of Russian domestic borrowing, Russian borrowing in rubles. We did see in the, under the Trump administration in 2019 a ban on primary borrowing uh, or ban on U.S. entities from being involved in the primary borrowing of Russia from hard currency markets as well. So what's what's different between the sanctions that were announced in 2019 and those that the Biden administration just announced? So the key difference there is the a, a ban on borrowing in the primary market for originally in 2019 it was for hard currency loans so if russia was seeking the russian government russian national bank russian wealth fund was seeking to borrow abroad in dollars euros pounds whatever u.s banks and u.s persons could not be involved in that now it is also a, a ban on u.s persons from being involved in the primary market for russian domestic bond issuances as well i would note however that Typically, if one looks at sort of emerging and developing markets worldwide, or really any market other than Britain, Europe, Japan, and the United States, and Switzerland, that typically foreign banks tend to be more involved in the, what is known as the book building, essentially the selling of hard currency debts of these markets. In Russia, Russian banks have really dominated, VTB in particular, have really dominated both of these since 2014. But overall, you know, the impact of both sanctions moves, both under the Trump administration and the Biden administration, because the ban is solely limited to this primary market, to the initial sale of the debts, its impact of both moves is very limited. And so the idea is that VTB or some other Russian bank can just buy up these these bonds when the when the Russian government needs to borrow money. It just borrows it from a Russian bank and then the Russian bank and then turn around and sell those bonds to anybody now or that's that's how the secondary market works is that right well that's how sort of an initial primary sale works and the book building works so the bank in that process is is usually known as the underwriting bank you have multiple banks involved if a so let's say a government wishes to sell a billion dollars in its debt it will go to the banks and say can you help me find buyers for this the bank will say yes in exchange for a you know few basis point fee in exchange for undertaking that activity if if they are unable to find sufficient sellers, then usually the bank will take that you know, risk on its own books. Mm -hmm. This is a important situation in crisis moments. You know, think of Greece in 2011 and the like. In Russia's context, it's it's presently not really that relevant. Russia has the ability to sell enough of this debt, both domestically and um, internationally, uh, arguably as well. And that's because it always it always pays its debts. It's not a risky thing to buy it well you know that that is you know russia is a particularly unique case in in sort of sovereign debt history which is that in 1998 russia defaulted mm -hmm. um on its debts but this is quite a significant moment for people who understand who study the you know sort of economics and and the political economy of this kind of decision making because russia in that instance actually chose to default on its domestic debts rather than print more rubles and it did not default on its key international debts some of them were later restructured uh, this helped Russia maintain good relations with, with the IMF and the like. Of course, it had significant domestic repercussions as well and, and a populist backlash mm -hmm. against that. Russia is really able to sell sell its debts because if one looks purely at the macroeconomic fundamentals of Russia, how much foreign currency it had and gold it has in its reserves, how its budget surplus works. Overall, Russia is a fairly, if one looks purely at the numbers, Russia appears to be a fairly healthy credit. For all its gold and macroeconomic fundamentals, however, Russia's credit rating still suffers a bit. 
In recent years, Moscow's bond contracts have also raised some eyebrows. Russia is usually viewed as a less healthy credit, ultimately by the credit rating agencies and by the markets than its pure fundamentals because of the associated political risks and because of the feeling that one will not necessarily get fair treatment. To this end, the Russians have recently begun changing some of the wording in their foreign bond contracts, particularly since 2016 and then with another change in 2018, that for me would you know, if I were a, an investor directly in these debts, I would have concerns over holding the ones issued after that because of the legal language that the Russians have changed. And so when you say that, that the language has changed and that that should maybe worry some buyers of, of Russian debt, does that mean that they, for instance, like what's one condition they've added that you say is... You so the, the key condition that they've added is what's something that is known as an alternate payments trigger. Uh, an alternate payments clause. And I, I apologize that this is going to get a little technical. But so essentially, normally, when, when one lends money um, to a, a developing country, the interest rate that that country has to pay on its bonds is set by the central bank rate, whereas the interest rate that it has to pay on foreign currency debt is in large part shaped by international market flows and in particular the rate of, of the U.S. base rate. Because the U.S. and the Western world have had near zero interest rates for so long now and, and because of the quantitative easing that has occurred, you've seen yields on hard currency Russian bonds fall quite a bit in recent years. Now, over the last year, we've seen the, the yield on, on Russian domestic ruble bonds fall as well. And just, j j sorry, j when you say like yields, you mean that d buying these bonds, you make less money? You, you would make a less money in a promised sort of, every bond has a fixed coupon, right? So if you buy $100 worth of this bond, we'll give you $10 every year. But of course, if the price of that bond goes up to 105, you know, then the, the $10 that you're getting is smaller than than 10%, right? So that's the yield versus the coupon. And so Russian bonds had, despite all of the political disputes w between Russia and the West in recent years, had been trading at quite a, a large spread to the amount that Russia had to pay to borrow domestically. Now, in terms of percentage, the terms of these bonds since 2018 say that in the event that international sanctions or other actions bar Russia from being able to borrow or deal in foreign currency borrowings that the Russian government can then choose to pay you back instead of in dollars or in euros, in pounds, Swiss francs, or in Russian rubles. And because of that differential in the interest rates, if they were to enact that trigger and say that sanctions have forced us to do this, it would effectively cause the price on the bonds that it had issued to crater. If the U.S. were to really impose a ban on, on secondary market trading as well of Russian bonds, and you'd effectively get a freeze, those situations and, and situations involving a ban on secondary debt are dramatic escalation above what we've seen now. And, wh and what exactly does that mean to, to ban secondary trading? That means that once the initial buyer of the bonds has it, they if they they then can't resell it or so the the primary market is the market that we talked about earlier with the banks selling it and selling it on the secondary market is the market that if you were to go on your computer today and say I want to buy you know this much in Russian ruble bonds this much in Chinese renminbi bonds this much in Russian dollar bonds etc cetera, etc cetera, I want to sell sort of that market of how things trade how the prices you know what what people see on Bloomberg terminals or other data providers that comes from the trading on the, the secondary market. Essentially, think about the secondary market. It is really the market for, for bonds, the same way you think about the stock market, right? But then the secondary market, that's you're saying that's more accessible. And so I guess like... D it, it, does that then it, Russia would then be would, would then be penalized or any country that's that's the target of secondary sanctions, they would suffer. Why exactly if if they've already sold their bonds. So I'll give you an example. So say, say you have a, an investment manager now who 
The investment manager says, I don't believe that Russia is going to start a new war with Ukraine. I think that Putin is going to look to be friendly. And I think that the oil price is going to be high and all these things that are headline good for the Russian economy. Right. So this guy, this hypothetical male or female, of course, um, investment manager goes and, and says, I would like to buy Russian bonds because I think that not only are they a good investment, but the price on that bond will rise. When the price on a bond rises, the, the yield falls. So that person would go and say, unless it happens to be that exactly right now the Russian government is selling new hard currency debts, which it's not, would go on uh, and call his broker. He'd look at his Bloomberg terminal here or she um, would look at his or her Bloomberg terminal and say, OK, I see Russian bonds are trading at this price. I'd like to buy it. And then in six months, his prediction has either come true or not come true. And, and he or her decides to s sell the bond. Now, if secondary market trading is not allowed, that individual would not be able to close that position. That individual would be stuck with that bond. Combining the sanctions from 2019 and the ones just announced this week, has that really affected Russia's ability to borrow internationally? Well, what I would declare so far, the actions that we've taken so far, you know, maybe the Rosneft sanctions in, in 2014, that was sort of a pot shot, but everything else has really been, you know, signaling and positioning and showing that, you know, we have our economic guns in the right position to, you know, escalate things sh should Russian actions say a renewed invasion of Ukraine. Russian troops have obviously remained in Ukraine and it is, you know, controlled Ukraine's territory in Crimea and in the Donbass for, for seven years, you know, my sort of understanding of it is that and for that it's really the messaging and the signaling that the Biden administration has put around it that's so important now you know it, it's not for me to sort of give policy advice and the like I my personal opinion would be that a renewed Russian of an invasion of Ukraine probably would warrant some kind of you know economic cut off like that but we do really have to see these not as just you know sanctions like putting some other russian you know cyber company on the sdn list right you know frankly who cares at this point it's pretty clear to me that no matter how many of you know quote unquote putin's friends or you know russian companies we sanction that is not fundamentally going to change what russia's foreign policy agenda is i do think the debt financing sanctions imposed under the sectoral sanctions in 2014 were the sort of really key bits at, at getting russia to halt and check its actions then. So one issue is that this is only the first step. So the future sanctions have less softer options in the future. They're reaching towards, you know, these nuclear options. So we're running out of harmless <laughs> options in the future. That's Dr. Maria Shagana, a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Eastern European Studies at the University of Zurich and a member of the Geneva International Sanctions Network at the Graduate Institute. I asked her what the U.S. sanctions on Russian sovereign debt mean now and down the road. That sanctions have a cumulative effect. They work, you know, on the long-term perspective. But Russia has proven, you know, that it can adapt, it can adjust. And the, the, the bonds were already issued with sanctions clauses that they could switch to different currencies. As I said, savings are quite substantial to cover any shortfall. So... In the future, it will restrain the pool of options how to raise money. And this is the maybe the thinking, the logic behind this is how, together with the pandemic, together with the drop in oil prices in the future, this will restrain the options how to, to raise money. Does Russia actually need foreign buyers for its, its sovereign debt or can it, or does it need... Does it need um, Western buyers? Can Russia just pivot to the East and 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 collect all the borrow all the money it needs, or would you, or do you think that that's that's not as simple as that? Well, that would be an easy answer for for Russia. <laughs> <laughs> but as we've seen with uh, China, for example, Chinese investors are as uh, uh, you know agile as business oriented as Western investors are. They do not necessarily cover what Western investors don't want to cover or tap into. And the Arctic or Rosneft's uh, Vostok oil is a primary example there. They still have failed to attract Indian or Chinese investors primarily because there is no economic fundamentals there. 
So state-owned companies, be it from China or India, could potentially capitalize on it. But companies uh, from Japan, India or China are still looking for win-win cooperation for a solid economic fundamentals and not just political favor. To your knowledge, what's the most successful example of using sanctions to deter, sort of change the behavior of another country? Just in, in history, as far as you are aware, because I know that you know when th- when we talk about the U.S. sanctions or the Western sanctions against Russia, a lot of people say, "Oh, well, the, you know, it hasn't det- it hasn't actually deterred them. They're they're too powerful to be influenced this way." Throwing all that aside, just like in history, what's what's an example of a real success story with sanctions? Because I, I haven't seen one with Russia and the United States so far. So I'm curious in this discipline, what's the what's the big success story sanctions are really hard to sell and the the recent developments under the trump administration have created this disdain almost for sanctions as a quick fix to overuse of sanctions with no linkage to grand strategy or more strategic thinking behind what they actually have to achieve and this is the first step in sanctions they need to be used as a nudge towards something. And this something has been in the uh, Ukraine sanctions program, the Minsk agreement. So this is a separate discussion. But this conditionality needs to be there for sanctions to be effective. So from the successful examples, we can name the GCPOA that sanctions pushed the Iranian leaders to the negotiation table to talk about how to denuclearize. And this is something what sanctions help to achieve. We also need multilateral agreement, Russia and China joined. So you can have a very long standing discussion why Russia's sanctions hasn't been effective in coercing and changing behavior. But if you look at uh, literature on international sanctions, they achieve this goal, this particular goal in changing behavior only in 12% of all cases that have been analyzed. So the expectations of sanctions high, they're very easy to discard to say that they don't work. But they do work if they're properly designed, if they're, you know, involve all relevant third parties that are important for this target state. If they are incrementally increased, the pressure is there. So there are a lot of elements that needs to be placed for them to work. So as I say, they're very hard to sell. But this is a tool that needs to be analyzed in comparison with alternatives. And the alternatives is rather statement of concerns, grave concerns, as we know from the EU, or a war. So this is the, the reality. Is there, is there, to your knowledge, has there ever been a case of what might be considered a powerful state? being affected by sanctions that, that, you know, something, whether you're talking about economic might or military might or, I don't know, cultural might or anything like this, is there, has there been a strong state that was, that, that responded to sanctions or is that not really work that direction? Well, Russia has been, yeah. So this is an exception with Russia that is a state that's been so much involved in the international economy that it was hard to sanction. I didn't see any research that distinguished between strong and weak states and how sanctions worked in that regard. The only research that I've seen, at least to my knowledge, is the distinction between democracy and autocracies. But that's... uh, that's a different. <laughs> and it, it, or democracy, or is one more susceptible to sanctions than the other? Yeah, well, the, the assumption is, or the, the results of these findings is that the democracies are much more susceptible than autocracies. So we are not on, a, on an optimistic track here. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to The Naked Pravda, an English-language podcast from Medusa. On today's show, we discussed U.S. sanctions against Russian sovereign debt and the nature of economic sanctions generally. You heard from Maximilian Hess, a political risk expert and a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and Dr. Maria Shagana, a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Eastern European Studies at the University of Zurich. And she's also a member of the Geneva International Sanctions Network at the Graduate Institute. The Naked Pravda is a podcast from Medusa. It's our only English language show. And next week, we'll probably be talking about the Russian authorities' escalating campaign against Alexei Navalny's anti-corruption organizations. But I still hope to put together, at some point, an episode about Russia's genetic research program. I mentioned this on last week's show at the very end. In our English language translation of Medusa's special report, 
on this very subject is now available at our website. Anyway, this is Kevin Rothrock, hoping you'll recommend us to your friends and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in to help put this program in front of more people. Thanks for listening and come back soon. Mm-hmm.